I'm Dawn Buse. I'm a board member of the American Headache Society, a professor in the Department of Neurology at Albert Einstein College of Medicine, the director of behavioral medicine at the Montefiore Headache Center, and I'm a psychologist and a researcher. The word comorbidity refers to two conditions that occur at a higher rate than chance. So if someone has condition X and condition Y and they're more likely to have those together than chance, that's a comorbidity. Different than a coexisting condition, meaning just you have this and you have that. This means somehow they're probably related. Migraine has a range of comorbidities and the more research we do, the more we keep finding. We actually like to organize them into groups because there are so many. There are psychiatric comorbidities. Those are going to include depression, anxiety, PTSD, panic disorders, and suicide attempts, among other conditions. Then there's medical comorbidities. Those are going to include things like asthma, allergic rhinitis, COPD, as well as pain conditions, fibromyalgia, Crohn's disease, chronic fatigue, and then there's also neurologic comorbidities, and those are going to include things like epilepsy, MS, and stroke. So there's a whole set of comorbidities. Someone with migraine may have any of those other conditions, and they're more likely to have any of those other conditions than someone who doesn't have migraine. It's very common for someone who lives with migraine to also have at least one other comorbidity. The rates vary depending on the comorbidity, and the rates also vary depending on the frequency and severity of someone's migraine. And as you know, we like to divide migraine into episodic migraine, which is headache 14 or fewer days per month, or chronic migraine, which is headache 15 or more days per month. So keeping those two um, delineations in mind, for example, depression, someone with Episodic migraine has about a 20% chance of having depression. Someone with chronic migraine has between a 30 and 50% chance of having depression as well. And as the frequency of headache goes up more days per month, the chances of having depression are higher. The rates are about the same for anxiety, and that includes generalized anxiety, panic disorder, and some other anxiety conditions such as PTSD. So someone with chronic migraine has a good 50% chance, maybe even up to 80% chance that they also experience anxiety. And certainly that makes sense. So someone with migraine is living with a chronic disease with episodic manifestations. So it's with them every day and yet they only have the attacks when they happen. And so they're going to spend a lot of time thinking about when is the next attack going to happen? Is it going to affect work? Is it going to affect school? Is it going to mean I cannot attend my child's soccer game? We call that interictal or preemptive anxiety, meaning anxiety about the next attack. Of course, they're going to have a lot of worries about the effect these attacks are already having on their life. Is it affecting work? And I actually see a lot of school teachers in my practice who can't miss work. That's not okay. They have to get a substitute. They're just not allowed to be out that much. So they worry a lot about, is the next attack going to mean I miss a day of work? They're also going to worry a lot about how it affects their family. And recently we've done research where we interviewed not only people with migraine, but we interviewed their spouses and their children and found how one parent having migraine affects the whole family. So it's not surprising that a lot of people who are living with migraine have anxiety, and yet it does make it a comorbidity. I mentioned some other areas. We mentioned some medical areas, which might sound surprising, like asthma, allergic rhinitis, COPD, sleep conditions, fibromyalgia, Crohn's, irritable bowel, a long list of conditions that people with migraine are also more likely to have. And when we think about why, there are actually competing theories, and it may be different for each of these conditions. It may be unidirectional. Having this causes that. It may be that it goes both ways. Having either one makes the other more likely. For example, in the case of depression and migraine, someone who has migraine is about five times more likely to develop depression later in their life, and someone who has depression is about three times more likely to later exhibit migraine in their life. 
Now, the third hypothesis may be that there is a shared underlying reason for both condition A and condition B. For example, is there something in the brain, the nervous system, maybe, for example, the serotonergic system that's involved in both migraine and depression? Is there a genetic reason? We know that migraine runs in families and it's got a strong genetic component. Is there something in our genes that makes us likely to have both migraine and depression? So there are many reasons, and it varies from condition to condition, why these might occur together. But for someone living with migraine, we want them to be aware of their potential comorbidities, get diagnosed and get treated because these are all treatable conditions and that's what's really important. The clinical implication of each of these comorbidities varies. So let me give the example of cardiac disease. So if we know that someone has had a heart attack, a myocardial infarction, that actually limits the medications that they can use to treat migraine. We know that the migraine-specific medications such as triptans and ergots are actually contraindicated. The FDA says do not use these if someone has had a heart attack. So when someone goes into their doctor, they may say, well, I'm here to talk about migraine. Maybe all these other things don't matter. But actually, the complete picture of someone's health really matters. And not only their health, but we want to think about their family history. We want to think about their mother, their father, what kind of conditions run in the family. Because if they're at high risk for heart disease, their headache or their migraine physician is going to want to take that into account when they make decisions about their treatment plan. Now the good news is there are various treatments that can still be effective for migraine even if you do have a limitation due to a comorbidity. So if you have that cardiac history, you might use different acute medications, you might try a preventive approach, and you might also try a behavioral approach. Maybe it's really good time to think about working on stress management, lowering the activation of the nervous system, do some biofeedback, some relaxation. And we do know from research that when all of those are combined together, we get the very best outcomes. So telling your healthcare professional about your entire medical history, even when you're there just to talk about migraine, is gonna be really important to tailor your best personalized plan for you. Now sometimes when a healthcare professional diagnoses more than one condition, so you've got maybe migraine and an additional comorbidity, they may be able to treat both of them, either with the same medication or combining and kind of personalizing a treatment plan. Although in some cases it may not be enough. So a good example of that is treating depression. One of the preventives that we use for migraine is an antidepressant. But the thing to keep in mind is that the dose it's used for in migraine prevention is much lower than the dose it's used for in depression. And in fact, it's not the most effective medication for depression. There are most better medications out there. So if I saw a patient in my office tomorrow and I see patients in my office every day who have migraine and depression, I would say let's treat both conditions the absolute best we can. Let's treat the migraine the absolute best way. Let's treat the depression the absolute best way. And for treating the depression, that's going to include a cognitive behavioral therapy approach, a relaxation training approach, as well as the very best medications available for depression at the right dose, if that's something that the patient and their healthcare professional decide together. And so I wouldn't limit the treatment of depression to only what's kind of a side effect of the treatment of migraine. I would treat both to the best that we have available. One thing I find in my work with patients with migraine is that they may feel personally embarrassed, ashamed, or guilty about these comorbidities. They may feel that it's a sign that they're not coping well enough with their migraine. And I want people to know this is just biology. This is just the way the human body and the human nervous system is set up. That these conditions commonly occur together, maybe for reasons of genetics, maybe for reasons of the neurobiology of our bodies, but these are nothing to be embarrassed or ashamed about.